in this online engagement session. This session is live streamed to YouTube and recorded. To protect your privacy, all participants have their video turned off and have been muted, and the chat functionality in Zoom is turned off. Sometimes technology troubles happen. There are a list of common challenges on Get Involved Kingston, including if your audio or video aren't working. You can also adjust your view options so that you can see both the presentation and the members of the project team at the same time. If your internet connection goes down, you can call into the meeting at the number displayed on your screen. Please write it down just in case. You can also follow this session live on YouTube. We will do our very best to help you with technical problems, but sometimes the easiest way to resolve issues is to log out of Zoom and rejoin the meeting. You can do that with your registration confirmation email. If you have a question at any point during the session, please use the Q&A feature, which is available to ask questions or following the presentation, there will be an additional option to raise your hand and ask a question verbally. The Q&A feature can be found on the bar across the bottom of your screen. To ask a question, type into the question area. And when a question comes in, the project team will work to respond to the questions. Please note, if we don't get to all of the questions, all of the questions and answers will be summarized by the project team and posed on the project page on Get Involved Kingston and the city website project page. The process for raising your hand to speak and ask a question is as follows. If you have a question or comment following the presentation, please use the raised hand function that can be found by following these steps. Click on the Q&A, a pop-up will appear there with, with multiple options. Please choose the raise hand option. The moderator will be monitoring this and will acknowledge you and then turn on your microphone so that you can ask a question or make a comment. The guidelines for participation are now on your screen. Is there anything additional that anybody would like to have added to the guidelines for this engagement session? And to confirm that everyone agrees, we would ask that if you are not in agreement to please raise your hand using the raise hand function. Thank you. Seeing no objections to the guidelines for participation, we will proceed into this online engagement session following the guidelines for participation. I am now going to pass this presentation over to Patricia Sharp, project manager with the Parks and Shoreline section of the city's engineering services department. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Um, hello everyone and good evening. Thank you for attending tonight and for using our new format for public consultation. Uh, this evening, we are introducing the proposed development for a new park and trails on Waterside Way, which is on the east side of the Cataraqui River in the Pittsburgh district. I'm Patricia Sharp, as Justin has already said. I'm with Parks and Shoreline at city, the city's engineering services department, and I am the project manager for this project. I'd also like to introduce the other members of the panel who are joining me tonight. Uh, first, we have Luke Falwell, the Director of Engineering Services here at the city. Uh, next is Neil Unsworth, who is Manager of Parks and Shoreline and Engineering Services. And then we have Brian Basterfield and Nichelle Leeson, both of whom are from Basterfield and Associates who are the landscape architecture firm that we have hired to design both the park and the trails. I would also like to mention that your district councillor, Ryan Bohm, is also in attendance. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I'd like to uh, give you a couple of particulars about the project. Um, first, with respect to the budget, the budget for the park and the trails, including both design and construction, so all in, is approximately $1 million. 
um, with respect to the timeline for construction, we expect to hire the contractor in the fall and then break ground later on in the season. And that would be weather permitting. Construction is expected to be completed by the following year, sometime in the summer of 2022. Um, I would also like to point out that tonight's session is introductory in nature and that Basterfield and Associates will be presenting a general overview of the project. Any feedback that we receive from tonight's session or from the online survey, which you can access by going to getinvolvedkingston.ca, and I know that a number of people have already done that, which is great. Uh, so we will be considering that feedback when we are advancing the design. Um, and I also want to point out that a second public information session will be held later this year. And it's at this second session where we will be presenting more detailed plans showing specific amenities such as playground equipment, the pathway layouts, the seating locations, um, and other amenities. Uh, at that time, there will also be another opportunity to provide feedback. So this is, it's not a done deal and this is not your last chance to have input. Uh, so I'm gonna now hand it over to our landscape architect, Brian Basterfield, who will walk you through the project. And once the presentation has been completed, we will then open it up for a question and answer period. Um, that being said, if you're typing in questions into the Q&A function during the presentation, then we would ask if you could preface your question with either the word park, if you're asking a question about the park, or the word trail, if you're asking about the trails, that way we'll be able to manage the questions and maintain some continuity while answering. Um, on that note, I'll now hand it over to Brian. Brian? Thank you, Patricia. Uh, if I could have the next slide, that would be great. So um, this evening is, uh, as Patricia mentioned, it is a uh, information and feedback opportunity. So we are we are here to listen to you and your thoughts on what you're seeing tonight. This is also a, a very high level point in the project where we're making, I would say, more planning approach decisions rather than design intent. But nevertheless, there is a design. Uh, attached to this that, that you can also comment on. Uh, the bottom line is we want to we want to hear your thoughts on what's being proposed at this very early stage uh, in the process. And as again, as Patricia mentioned, we will be uh, reconvening with the neighborhood with the uh, public session uh, later in the summer uh, to start to focus in on some of the uh, the more detailed conceptual work. Next slide, please. So this is a fairly new community and this community has an absolutely wonderful natural asset running along its west side. Um, that's shown in green uh, on the image you can see in front of you here. Uh, uh, this wooded area can provide residents with nature appreciation, contact with nature, opportunities that other communities would love to have. So it is an absolute wonderful asset for this community and in such close proximity to the community. Having said that, although it is an asset, uh, the wooded area is part of an environmental protection area. It is ecologically sensitive and it has uh, cultural heritage features embedded in it. So what this means is that any proposed features must have little or or no impact on the woodland. And this is particularly in the woodland area, not the parkland area. Uh, and so in this regard, uh, we have an ecologist on our team and we have an arborist on our team and they are going to assist our design team as we move forward to ensure that we're paying close attention uh, to the ecological imperatives associated with, with this site. You'll notice there is a gap between the uh, say the north end of the green area and the south end of the green area, uh, that gap is, is simply the existing uh, Greenwood West parquet. Uh, there's a walkway going down towards uh, the stormwater, well, uh, an access road going down towards the stormwater pond. Um, and that access road will actually become the connection point for the trail moving north. Um, 
finally, the just to get your bearings on the uh, park location, if you look at the uh, intersection of, of Waterside Way uh, and the junction with uh, Summer Street, that's the location of the neighborhood parkland area. And with that, I'll flip to the next slide, please. So this is an overview of the proposed neighborhood park and we're starting with the neighborhood park areas in, in talking about planning approaches and design approach. Um, this is an overview view of it. Uh, we're gonna zoom in on that right now so that you can see it clearer and the text is more legible for you and we can focus on the south half and the north half. So if we can go to the next slide, that would be great. So this is the uh, south end of the park and it's bounded by uh, an existing stormwater pond, uh, the woodlot to the west and to the south uh, housing, um, uh, new housing in the neighborhood. We will be uh, maintaining the existing woodlot edge and you can see that uh, green uh, curved edge running along uh, the north end of the park area. We'll be maintaining that existing woodlot edge. Uh, the drainage swale, there is a drainage swale, that blue dashed line that runs uh, adjacent to the woodlot edge uh, feeds subdivision water to the stormwater pond. That area will be vegetated with woodland buffer plants. Um, there is a, a great viewing opportunity in association with the stormwater pond. Uh, that looks over the ponds uh, to the woodlands beyond. And that's identified with those, uh, that brown semicircle and the lines pointing out towards uh, the storm pond and woodland area. There will also be uh, tree planting uh, along the walkways in the parks. And you can see that, uh, as I say, we're not in a detailed stage yet. So those bubbled green areas uh, represent tree planting areas or opportunities. And uh, we also want to maintain, you'll see the large dashed line to the, uh, to the bottom of the illustration, the large yellow dashed line. That is a maintenance route uh, for the stormwater pond. And we're going to take advantage of that maintenance route and tie it into both the trail system and uh, the, uh, the walkway portion of the park itself. The smaller yellow uh, dotted line that you can see uh, starting in circle the parkland, uh, that indicates an optional pathway loop. Um, with budget permitting, we'd like to make that loop uh, around the entire parkland space to, to connect all the features of the, uh, of the parkland. Next slide, please. So this is the north end of the park. And uh, we anticipate having uh, a woodlot entry. So the large, uh, the orange circle that you can see, uh, the call off to woodland trail entry, uh, uh, we would like to see an opportunity to celebrate that entry so that from the parkland itself, from the, from the neighborhood park, you can see towards the entrance to uh, the woodland and have a pathway connection that follows Waterside Way uh, from the park to that woodland con uh, connection. Uh, the brown area that you see is a proposed playground. And at this point in time, we're uh, anticipating the typical neighborhood parkland uh, equipment of a junior senior uh, play facilities. Shade trees and benches would surround this area for people viewing the activities in the, in the playground. Uh, we also are anticipating an open, large open flat uh, lawn area uh, for uh, informal play activities and just general turf grass area. And then uh, the medium sized dashed yellow lines uh, really just indicate our anticipated uh, walkway area through the park. Uh, as I mentioned, we'd love to do a circular loop right around the park, but at the very least, there will be a walkway that loops around the play area and makes connections out to the sidewalk itself. Um, we also see 
trying to develop where that large red dot is a more of a formal arrival point into the park. And that's because we've got, we've got a sidewalk connection coming across Waterside Way from Summer Street and Waterside Way sidewalk terminates at that location as well. So we see that as a convergence point where it would be great to celebrate an arrival into the park. Next slide, please. So we're just showing some, uh, these are not, this is not equipment that we're planning to put in the park. These are character images, uh, precedent images, if you will, that, that simply show uh, junior play, uh, senior play features. So a little more robust for the senior play and, and a little more accessible for the, for the toddlers for the junior play area. Next slide. And just in terms of character, I mean, you have some beautiful neighborhood parks in Kingston and, and I, I think you can look upon them to see the kinds of standards that are set, but uh, certainly there would be fixed uh, bench seating uh, with space for uh, wheelchair access beside the bench, waste containers, shade trees, uh, asphalt walkways around the uh, perimeter of the park or at the very least around the play area and an image of, of the open lawn play field area. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the south sector development strategy. So leaving the parkland uh, discussion at this point and talking a little bit about the uh, uh, the trail development in the south end of, of our project area. And it's spanning from the uh, south end where we show a large uh, red star there, a proposed lookout area, and it goes north to Schooner Drive. Again, we're going to break this into uh, enlargements so you can see it a, a little closer. So next slide, please. So this is the uh, south end. Um, as I mentioned, the, the large red star is a proposed lookout. It has a natural clearing of tree canopy. <clears throat> it has excellent views across the river. Uh, it has some exposed limestone pieces uh, at the shoreline and it provides a level viewing area near the shoreline. Uh, and we can also create a, uh, so it doesn't, at this point in time feel like a dead end, we can create a loop system to the, uh, to the trail to bring you back up uh, along the pathway from which you came. When I mention a, a proposed lookout, I want, want to be clear that this is uh, an, uh, an area and not a feature. So this would not be a structure that you walk onto and upstairs for a lookout. It's much lower key than that and it has to be low key because of the environmental uh, uh, sensitivity of the area. <clears throat> the main pathway is the orange uh, dashed line that you can see. And the main pathway runs through uh, a mixed hardwood forest uh, with quite an open understory. So there's good visibility through the woodland area. There are some very, very large old trees in this area that we will uh, uh, see along the woodland trail, but by all means uh, preserve them. There's also an existing uh, beaten path trail, which is always the line of least resistance. So that pathway will be the starting point for us making considerations about any rerouting of, of the trail system. <clears throat> the trail does slope significantly down to the proposed viewing area, the lookout and uh, rises up to level ground uh, near the stormwater pond. What we wanna do in the woodland trail area is uh, provide a, a wider trail width with a hard packed granular surface. Uh, we need to use the location and the structure of the existing trees and, and vegetation to determine our trail route. So we're going to let the forest speak to us about how the trail evolves in terms of its, its uh, organization and, and maneuvering through the woodland areas. <clears throat> the yellow star is just indicating a really cool feature that I'll, I'll show a photo of uh, in a minute here of an excellent uh, 
uh, historical feature, a stone, uh, a stone fence. We'd like to maintain that fence and provide trail access to improve uh, the interpretive uh, value of, of that old feature. And then finally, you can see how uh, at the, at the uh, bottom of the parkland, how the stormwater pond maintenance road uh, essentially turns into an asset for both the parkland and connectivity to the proposed new trail. Uh, next slide, please. So we're moving north here from the, uh, and you can still see the, uh, the new park location, um, but we're moving uh, north to points uh, to align with Scarlet Street and um, Schooner Drive. So just pointing out a few of the, uh, uh, the features of this area and the opportunities in this area. Uh, the trail runs parallel to Waterside Way. We don't yet know exactly where that will be. As I mentioned earlier, we're gonna let the woodland speak to us in terms of how uh, that trail is, is laid out. Uh, the area does have sloping grades from the existing road, the woodland. So we have a, a grade drop that we have to deal with, but we want to provide a level landing area uh, at those entry points. And if we have to selectively remove vegetation that's in the road right of way uh, to uh, celebrate those uh, entry points as, as we can and provide good access into the trail. <clears throat> the, uh, the yellow dashed lines uh, simply indicating that from your neighborhood, from the neighborhood, um, these are the corridors for which people will uh, head towards uh, uh, the trail system, walking down the sidewalks um, and into the uh, trail nodes that we're showing there. And we've also shown trailhead points. Uh, we're not sure whether they'll be consistent with the other uh, trail entry features, but uh, two uh, proposed trail entry points uh, into the, uh, from the trail and into the parkland itself. And what we're trying to do there is just provide a a seamless connection between the park connectivity to the uh, trail system. Next slide, please. So these are photos taking, taken on the site. Um, you can see uh, the image on the left is the proposed lookout location. <clears throat> so. Uh, this helps you understand a little better the, the condition. It's, it's an open cleared area that with a little bit of manipulation of, of grade uh, can allow for uh, perhaps a bench and an area where you can linger and take in those fantastic views of the Cataraque River. The image to the right is the existing uh, stone fence that some farmer many, many years ago moved rocks to work the fields and it's got some really good uh, heritage value to it. The next slide over is the uh, slope coming down from Waterway Park into the woodland area. This is just on the curve near the, near the, uh, the neighborhood park area. So you can see the, the slope condition that we're faced with there. <clears throat> and then finally a shot looking along the, uh, the beaten path that exists through the woodland at this point point in time. Next slide. Uh, these, are, uh, these are photographs that uh, indicate what we're heading towards in terms of uh, the trail itself. I want to underscore again, this is a woodland trail. Um, it will be uh, a hard packed granular feature. And again, uh, it likely won't be as straight as these two images show. We will be meandering through the woodland area to minimize any potential impact uh, on the woodland. Um, I also just want to indicate uh, that this is a woodland trail and uh, it's, it's not a multi-use recreational corridor. Uh, so we see it as a, a soft touch and an opportunity for residents and, and visitors to the neighborhood to experience uh, the woodlot in a, a comfortable trail corridor. 
Next slide. <clears throat> so we're looking at the north uh, section of the park. Um, you can see green, uh, the, the green circle, the green oval area there is uh, existing uh, Greenwood West Parkette area. You can see the stormwater pond and the blue line is the existing asphalt path that leads down to the stormwater pond for both maintenance and the future connectivity to the trail. Uh, <clears throat> next slide, please. So just looking at the, uh, the, the south end of, of this area, uh, as I mentioned, existing parkland is there. There will be an arrival point, a trail arrival point on the uh, west side of, of the roadway. And uh, when the trail system to the north is complete, you'll be able to walk down the asphalt road to the, to the stormwater ponds and then make the connection to the, uh, to the new trail system. <clears throat> there is uh, a fairly steep grade coming down from the existing asphalt at this point in time. And the area will require some fill to provide safe access down into the woodland area. Next slide. So here we are at the, uh, the very north end of our, <clears throat> of our study area, project area. And uh, you can see again, the uh, orange dashed line, which is the proposed uh, main trail to the north. We want to provide, <clears throat> excuse me, we want to provide a wider trail width and, and hard packed granular similar to the south end as well. And also the location and structure of this trail will again be determined by the, the vegetation and the tree canopy on the site. Um, there are no uh, connection points north because at this point in time, the northward connections uh, don't have an arrival point uh, in the fullness of time that that may work out. But at this point in time, uh, the trail will curve up back onto Waterside Way Park. Um, and this area also has a, a fairly steep grade and we will need to consider some fill coming up to that uh, arrival point to Waterside Way. Um, the neighborhood sidewalks on the opposite side of Waterside Way will also be the feeder points for, uh, for the community. Next slide. So for those who have not uh, seen the area, uh, the image on the left is the asphalt uh, um, maintenance road down to the stormwater ponds, which will also serve as the access to the trail going beyond the, uh, the asphalt area. And on the uh, right-hand side, you can see the existing uh, grass slope at the proposed trail entry point coming up between those uh, two residences. Next slide. These are the same comments, same images, uh, same comments mentioned earlier about uh, our need to have a very light touch in the woodland area. Light touch means uh, materials that will contribute to uh, um, uh, materials that won't deter from water percolation into the woodland area and materials <clears throat> that are flexible enough to accommodate the movement of the forest bed as root structures uh, have implications in, in the smoothness of the trail. So that concludes uh, sort of the planning approach that we would like to take uh, in this study area and some of the design intent that we're heading towards. Um, and uh, I would like to pass it on now to uh, Patricia, I believe, to uh, carry on. Thank you. Good. Um, next slide, please, Justin. Good, thank you. Um, before we open the floor to questions, I'd like to address an inquiry that we've had in advance of tonight's session. And I also see that the question has been asked. So I think it's good that we're going, about to address it. Um, uh, the, the question is about the mound of dirt that is currently located on the park site. Um, so the removal of that dirt is the responsibility of the developer. 
and we are continuing uh, to work with them and be in conversation with them about this. And they have indicated that they will be removing the dirt mound this summer. We expect it to be completely removed by the time we are ready to start construction. Uh, once the dirt pile has been removed, the developer will then be constructing the maintenance access route to the stormwater ponds, which are on the eastern edge of the park. And it is our intention to blend the access route into the overall pedestrian pathway system for the park. Um, next slide. Uh, so now that I've answered that question, uh, which I believe was Colin's question, uh, we can open it up to more uh, to questions about the park itself. Thank you, Patricia. Um, I'll go through the questions in order that they've appeared in the Q&A. The first question is from Mary Willick. Uh, will the ground cover under the playground be rubber for accessibility, as in the example photos? and no wood chips. Um, I can take that question. Um, we typically do do uh, engineered wood fiber as the playground surfacing, which is a little bit different than wood chips because it is developed specifically for playground surfacing. And, and so the particle size is smaller and the way it's installed is, is to uh, be impact resilient um, and in terms of accessibility, we, we do run that by the Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee to, uh, to see that they um, are, are okay with that as an accessible surface. And in our previous parks, they have um, thought it has been fine and they've tested it. Thank you. Next question. The next question is from Councillor Ryan Bone. Regarding the park, it came up in discussion today, the west side of Greenwood Park has no splash pad or water feature. Can a water feature be incorporated into this park? Uh, for example, splash pad or at least a misting station, et cetera. Um, I can also take that question. Uh, a, a splash pad is not proposed for this uh, park. Um, the city's parks and recreation master plan lays out the future locations, possible locations for splash pads in the city. So I'd like to refer you to that document, um, which you can find on the city's website. Um, uh, Waterside Way is not an identified location for splash pad at this time. Thank you. The next question is from Mary Willick. Again, regarding the park, um, could there be playground equipment to include swings? Also, can shade sails be considered until trees are mature enough to provide a shaded area? I, I can speak a little bit to the, uh, the playground equipment, including swings. Swings are always a great uh, feature in, in junior and senior play. So uh, um, it's something we typically strive to include, whether it's in, uh, in a low key fashion or more robust, but a lot of it depends on the space that's available. Uh, so we typically explore the notion of having swings in the, in the play area. Uh, cannot speak to the shade sails, perhaps uh, Patricia can. Um, yes, in terms of sails or gazebo, um, th those could be considered, of course, it would be budget. Those are budget dependent items and uh, depending on the number of amenities, um, they may, um, uh, they may be, cons we'll, we'll consider them. We'll probably come back with you with an answer to you with an answer at the next session. Um, so the next question regarding the park is from Peter Burpee. Has any consideration been given to something more ecological than the standard cookie cutter plastic equipment typical of Kingston parks? Uh, 
Um, Patricia, perhaps yeah. you can answer that, Patricia. I, I'm assuming by um, ecological, you mean um, park equipment, playground equipment that's made of uh, natural materials such as wood. Uh, so we do have a couple of, exa of examples in Kingston where we've used uh, wood, wood structures. Um, I can give you uh, Fairway Hills Park is one of them. And you can go look at that. And we're about to install them at Max, Max Crescent Park in the, um, that's under about to be under construction. So that'll be coming then. For this park, we are taking feedback about playground equipment at this time. Um, so it's possible it could be considered. Uh, uh, we do find that those types of pieces of equipment uh, don't have the lifespan of the other piece of equipment. And we expect that this is going to get significant use. That is something that should be considered when we are selecting playground equipment. And the last question of the, regarding the park is um, from Councillor Bohm. Um, so with respect to not having a splash pad, is there, a, what about a misting station, at least for hot days when kids are playing? Um, I'll take that. Um, a misting station. If, so my feelings about a misting station is, is that the amount of uh, technical, the technical requirements and the budget and the health requirements to do a misting station might be uh, comparable to a splash pad. And um, if we were going to do that, then we might as well just do a splash pad. Um, however, I am not, it occurs to me that a misting station also might not be as technically complex as I am thinking, and maybe we can consider it. I just, I just don't know at this time, we'd have to discuss it and come back to you with an answer in the, at the next session. Okay, and I see one one other questions coming from regarding the park, and then I'll move to the trail questions. Um, thank you, everyone, for patiently waiting. Um, is from Mary Bathurst. Is it possible to get a basketball court since the current playset on Waterside Way is for very young children? I can I can answer that. Um, a basketball court. Uh, so basketball courts is not part of the current plan, but um, if we hear that there is significant interest from the community out of these sessions, then uh, uh, some sort of basketball play could be considered. We don't think that there is the space to have a full on court, but perhaps a, a small half court or a hoop could be, could be installed. Um, again, that is something that we could, uh, that we will probably have an answer to at the next session after getting the feedback from these sessions. And, and I do know that there are a couple of um, participants that have raised their hands. I, uh, I have, uh, do see those here. I'll, I'll do a, take a couple of questions from the Q&A and then move to the uh, verbal questions shortly. Um, the next question regard, is regarding the trail uh, from Ryan Heath. Why is there a break in the path between Biscayne and Waterside Way? This will create a risk for all, especially kids, by forcing people onto or across the road. I'll take that. Uh, go ahead. Or, okay. No, go ahead, Patricia. Okay. Um, so yes, um, the reason that, it, that it's currently designed like that is because the, the sidewalk is in fact on the east side of the road, which the developer was asked to do because the housing is on the east side of the road. Um, and then I, I do know uh, that there are concerns about having to cross the road. And that is, um, that is something that is outside the scope of the park. And it's also broader than, the, uh, than what the Parks and Shoreline Department can deal with. But knowing about this in advance gives us a chance to reach out to um, other departments such as the Transportation Department and discuss it with them and get their feedback on what, whether they think it's possible to have a, to continue the connection on the west side. We just don't know right now if that is feasible and we will be reviewing it with other departments over the course of the summer and again should have more information at the next session. But we understand 
that it would make a lot of sense to have a continuous trail. We're just not sure if we're able to do it at this time. The next question from Councillor Ryan Bone. Can the trail be continued on the north side of Waterside Way from the parkette between Biscayne and Schooner Drive to provide a more continuous trail and avoid unnecessary road crossings to reduce traffic incidents? The trail then goes back into the woods at Schooner, which seems to flow better. Um, is that a similar question to the one that I just, are we talking about the same location? I feel like we are. Uh, maybe we can, uh, maybe if Councillor Bohm could um, let me know or let Justin know if it's, if, if I've answered the question satisfactorily in the previous answer. Uh, yes, that is the same location. Okay. Apologies, uh, appreciate it. Thanks. The next question is from Sheena Bamsey. Uh, what distance from home, the homeowner property line is the trail access pathway fence normally situated? Um, again, I think I need um, clarification um, in that we don't typically have a trail access fence. Um, I'm just wondering, Sheena, if you are one of the residents that flanks the northern uh, entrance way on Waterside Way where we have the steep slope and if your house is one of those two houses. And she, so, there, sorry, Justin. There is a follow-up question. Um, from her regarding uh, mentioning that our property line is quite close to the house. Uh, we and our neighbor would like a little more space to the fence, say an additional four feet, which we would fully maintain on our respective sides. Okay. Lower, lower down at the slope, both homes have a substantive retaining wall, a retailing wall. We think it would make sense to widen the walkway there to the walls rather, rather than at a fence as well and incur an inaccessible area for maintenance. I don't know if that, help provide some yep. additional context. Yeah, that does help. Actually, Sheena, um, we we in the Parks and Shoreline Department are going to reach out to you and the and the other neighbor on the other side to discuss that because we understand the issues that are that come with that entrance way. So I'll probably if you could um, send me directly your contact information and I think I may have already got it, but we'll reach out and discuss that with you offline um, directly. Uh, next question. Next question regarding the trail from Ryan Heath. Does the path surface meet the AODA requirements for outdoor spaces? Um, is this the path for the trail or the path for the park? If it's the path for the park, we will be meeting AODA requirements for outdoor spaces. And if it is the, if we're talking about the trail, we are aware that there are significant slopes within that um, space that may not be accessible, um, that we will have to work on the alignment uh, for that. But we may, it's possible that we may not be able to achieve AODA compliance. And, and just, just to interject on that, Patricia, to the, <clears throat> the actual surfacing itself uh, will be a limestone screenings path, a compacted limestone screenings path. So, uh, as, as durable and smooth of a granular surface as we can get, but it, is, it, it cannot be paved. The next question on the trail from Doug Walker. Is there a possibility to join the North and South trails? At present, you would need to exit the North trail, cross waterside, then walk on the sidewalk for a short distance and cross waterside again, the road curves in this area. I think, I, think that, I think that's a good question. And I think Patricia, you, you hit the nail on the head earlier with the, the discussion about, uh, about the trail uh, gap and having to use the sidewalk and, and reaching out to other departments to look at solutions along the roadway. Am I correct? Yes. Yes, you are. Okay. Um, 
The next question from Rob Berry. From the shoreline at the far north end of a proposed trail below Colleen Tom is a flat level shore that could be another, another excellent viewing location at the river's edge. Could a trail be purposed to this location? No. Yeah. I, I think that I'm not, um, I think that's a nice idea. We would have to look at it. Um, I might ask Neil because I know that he's very familiar with this area and he could maybe weigh in on that. I am Neil Unsworth, uh, Manager of Parks Development. Um, uh, I do know the land very well. Um, and in the fullness of time, should we gain land access up towards the 401 um, along, along the river? That's exactly where the trail loop or the, where, the, where the nature trail would kind of extend. Uh, at this time, there, there is some uh, land access um, restriction and uh, we want to be a little bit cautious about um, you know, staying on our land. And uh, we'll have a look at it and see if there is another lookout opportunity. Uh, of course, people really enjoy those. Um, but at this time, uh, it's not shown in the current scope, but we'll, we'll certainly have a look at it this, uh, this summer. Thanks. I'm going to um, open the um, a verbal question from Erica Schmatz. Hello, I live on Waterside Way. I'm one of two people that use a, a wheelchair in this area. And it's great that you guys are talking about these amazing trails. And I understand that the accessibility and how that stands. Then at least give us the park and pave it. Give us something like it's, it's kind of disheartening all this work that's going into this part of it and we might get shore shifted all together. So just get that consideration. Yes. Thanks, Erica. Yes, we will. We will be uh, giving the park, the paving, the pathway in the park. <laughs> paved. <laughs> yes. I have a question from uh, Riley Cassidy. Um, it's just going early to the earlier point uh, that Patricia mentioned at the beginning of the Q and A regarding the mound of dirt. Um, that is it, it extremely dangerous. It is at least 15 feet tall. Uh, children play on it and adults frequently take rocks from it. Who is liable if someone falls and is seriously injured? Why can't the city do more in terms of ordering the developer to move it as soon as possible? Riley, I'll, I'll, I'll address that. Uh, so as I've said, we are in conversation with, with the developer about that mound. Um, now you've asked about who is liable. I believe that it's occupant. He is the occupant, so he would be liable. However, we have part of the conversation has been to extend the fencing, including along the backyard properties, which I believe your property is one of them. Um, he indicated that he would be extending the fencing and I believe it was to be this week. Um, so I will check back with you directly to see if that has happened. Um, I'd give him a couple of days. Um, but that uh, we do not have the authority to, at this point, order him around about the dirt mount. But he is being cooperative, so I'm, I'm comfortable that he is going to have it removed by the time we need it removed. The next question on the trail from Peter Burpee, what is the length of the trail from end to end? Um, we, we did a couple of takeoffs and I believe it was about one kilometer. Uh, that was the, the, the sections, one kilometer, one and possibly up to one and a half depending on the alignment. Okay, and the next question from Doug Walker, what is the projected timeline for continuing the trail behind Baxter North beyond the 401? I can take that one. Um, it's very long range. Um, so I just want to be clear that um, the land ownership between um, the Pauline Tom subdivision, the, the, the most northern subdivision, uh, which was, um, uh, and, and the 401, the, the, the trail system would require access between um, six and 10 private properties um, 
to, to, to be completed and it could be uh, decades before that happens. Um, the city does have a land access strategy um, where if there's development or there's improvements where we have access to gain these, um, uh, these works, we, they are in our official plan, but they're very, very long range. And, and um, I suspect it will be uh, more than one decade, um, potentially two or more. Thank you. Um, the next question from Sam Evers, for the storm pond access slash trail access road that runs behind Riverview Way, will the city be installing a fence behind the houses that back onto the trail? If so, when will that work be done and how close to the property line will the fence be? Um, uh, a fence is not currently part of the proposed work. Um, so we wouldn't be doing that. And so it won't be close to your property line. Um, however, we will be taking feedback about all the elements. And I know that uh, that question has been received and, I, and if there's substantial interest in having a fence, we could consider it. Last question on the trail is regarding a lookout point. Can you please describe the water access at the lookout point further? It would be nice to be able to have a natural water access point for the residents in the area. And uh, that question is from Mary Bouchard. Um, I, um, if you mean by water access, I, I think that a couple of things come to mind. Uh, one would be either a boat launch or swimming. So the point of the trail lookout, the lookout at this point, the intention of it is not to have either one of those, not a boat launch or swimming. It is meant to be just a naturalized lookout um, as a rest stop once you are along the trail, spend some time there and then turn around and make, and make your way back along the trail. So water access at this is not part of the programming for the lookout. Thank you. And one final question in the Q&A um, from Councillor Bohm with regards to the park. What is the feasibility of a paved loop around the park for those that may not be able to access the Woodland Trail? Please consider paving the trail loop around the park so all can use it. Um, I want, I'm, I'll answer it and I want to make sure that I understand that we are speaking about paving within the park proper. If, if, if that is what we were speaking about, then yes, we will be paving the loop in the park proper. Um, if this is a loop on the actual trail that's inside the ecologically sensitive area of the woodland, we, we are not able to pave that, but we will be making an effort to, to have paving paved walkways within the park. And Councillor Bohm has confirmed that that would, yes, indeed within the park proper. Yeah. That concludes the questions in the Q&A. I thank all the panelists for answering those questions. I have Um, have one raised hand. I will, Erica Smuts. I'm not sure if, would you, was there a question? I just, un, I've un no, it's just as I said, it's the same point that was brought up. I know that you're saying inside the park is to be paved. It's the one that you had as a dotted line that may or may not be paved depending on funding. And I'm finding that this, this whole thing has been a little bit disheartening does not seem to, to be any way, it like, does not seem to make it an inclusive neighborhood that it seems that it's more worried about other points and not inclusivity. And I'm just finding this, the whole meeting a little disappointing that way. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Erica. Um, I guess maybe I've, I, I might've I've missed, so, I was wondering, can we go back in the 
the slide panel, the slide show. Yeah. Remember and the one that you guys were talking about, the one with the dotted line that you made depending on funding pave? So it's not that one. It's not that one. No, it, 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 it was the loop around the entire park. Yes. Yes. So it was early, early on in the slide yeah. deck and, and there's yeah. part of it and there's the rest of it. Yeah. That one right there, yes. Yeah. So it's the, the yellow dotted one. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes, so as part of, so part of the feedback that we're taking tonight is that uh, comments such as these, we, we will consider. So we now know that paving, uh, paving this looped path within the park is important and we will definitely consider it. Okay. And I have one other raised hand from Christine Innocent. Hi, I've just joined. So unfortunately I don't have the benefit of having watched your presentation. Unfortunately, my time is not quite my own. Um, but if you've already addressed this, I apologize. But if you wouldn't mind, I'm noting that the path is very short. Um, and I say that from an active, healthy lifestyle perspective. Our community on this side of Highway 15 is very cut off from all of the wonderful parklands and trails on the other side, just because it's a very dangerous road and it's getting nothing but danger, more dangerous. Um, traffic lights at the corners are not enough for me to send my eight-year-old to go ride her bike. So I'm concerned that we're not building enough on this side in the way of actual distance for kids to get on a bike and go or go for a big walk. You know, we do have a lot of land. There is the option to connect over to the parkland and the quarry, which wouldn't give a whole lot more runway. Um, but I'm wondering how we're going to address this because this community is growing at at least one new family a week, if not more. Uh, and then with the new apartment building coming in and the quarry being developed, it's going to be a large community on this side of 50. Thank you. Patricia, may I answer that? Oh, yes, Neil, please do. Yeah, so thanks for the question. And no, we didn't actually address it completely in the presentation. So thank you, Christine, for bringing it up. Um, the path, the trail system in the woodlands is proposed to continue south of what um, Brian and his staff have drawn to date and to connect into potentially two locations one of which would be the future quarry subdivision, um, and one of which would be potentially near a walkway block that's located um, at the very south uh, west corner of your subdivision. Um, I believe there's a small utility station in that corner. Um, there's some feasibility issues associated with that. It's quite steep in there and there's a large ravine in between, but there is a larger pathway plan for, for, for your community um, for, for the Woodland Trail system. And, and, and we are going to be bringing that back to you um, in, in the late summer or the early fall. And um, it is quite extensive. It's very different than what's over in Greenwood Park um, because it's not a multi-use pathway system. It's a totally different experience. It's not a place you would go and ride your bicycle uh, um, or rollerblade, um, but it is, it's much, you know, in a way it's more special um, because it has uh, a remarkable woodland. So I think you're gonna have actually quite a lot of amenity. The pathways to the south are unfortunately just logistically, they have to wait until the subdivision to the south is approved and then starts to get built. Um, but there is a budget plan for that. Um, unfortunately, we don't know how long it will take to build that subdivision to the south. Um, but, um, but yes, there is a larger plan for a fairly robust trail system uh, that will come off of uh, this park. Thank you. I did have a follow up. Am I still unmuted? Yep, we can hear you. Terrific. Um, so I, I appreciate the timelines with connecting up with potential other areas. Um, I recognize it's not reasonable to ask for that right now. My follow-up question I suppose would be, I mean, it's our hope that the city doesn't view things in silos. Um, and we're perfectly aware there's a wonderful trail system 
on the other side of Highway 15 that our community could access, especially in this interim period before anything is built, et cetera, on this side. Um, and I'm curious as to if there's any plans to provide safe pedestrian crossing for 15. I think we'll uh, take that feedback and um, talk to the relevant departments and we can provide you a response to that um, when we report back to you in this summer. Uh, but thanks for the question. Okay. Just a note here uh, for all um, participants to receive project updates, you may click subscribe on the Get Involved Kingston page. Um, like to now thank everyone um, here tonight for participating. It has been very good to hear from all of you about this project and to be able to share with you about the project. We do have an evaluation poll that we would ask you to complete about this online engagement session, uh, which will now be launched on your screen. And the reporting back for this engagement session will be posted on the Get Involved Kingston project page and the city website project page. Um, if you have signed up to receive updates about this project, you will be notified when it is live on the site. If you haven't signed up to receive notifications, please once again go to the Get Involved Kingston project page and sign up to receive project notifications and updates from the project team. I'll wait a few more moments for uh, attendees to respond to the polls. Thank you for uh, viewing and responding to those questions. It's very helpful information for us. Okay, thank you everyone for voting. I will now end the polling. It's very much appreciated once again. Once again, thank you very much um, for taking the time to join us this evening. This uh, marks the, uh, the end of the session and concludes the session for this evening. I'll just um, ask ISNT to please end the recording and end uh, the webinar for everyone. Thank you again to the panelists and the attendees for joining us and participating this evening.